Good evening and welcome to the Hutton Ethics Lectureship. My name is Holly Banty and I'm the Associate Vice President for Research and Research Security and Ethics. This evening marks the final event as part of the Cincinnati Ethics Center here at the University of Cincinnati lineup of events today. And thank you for all those who've been with us today during the various events. It's been an awesome day of presentations and discussions. And this, can, this presentation is only gonna add um, to that conversation and, and thread. So we are excited to have you here. We are excited to welcome Dr. Um, Bridget Pratt She's joining us all the way from Australia, thus the evening start time. And so um, we look forward to her presentation in just a few minutes. But of course, I must um, go over some housekeeping. Um, just make sure that your name is uh, correctly displayed in the Zoom box um, so that I know who you are and I can follow up with you um, to send you um, an evaluation form at the conclusion of this event. Um, and for those of you who want CME credit, um, please make sure that you do return those evaluation forms to me. Obviously, I would like everyone to complete an evaluation form and return it to me, but certainly for those who are applying for CME credit, that is a requirement. The chat feature will be used um, to ask questions of the presenter at the conclusion of her remarks. Um, and I will be facilitating that um, discussion with uh, Dr. Rick Ittenbach. Um, and so please send those um, questions to me on the chat so that I can help um, with that conversation. I believe that's all I need to cover for housekeeping. I would like to introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. Richard Ittenbach, um, Professor in Pediatrics and Associate Director for Planning and Evaluation in the Division of Biostatistics and Epidemiology at Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center. Rick is going to honor the Hutton Family Foundation who makes this lectureship and other lectureships possible in the College of Medicine. And he will also introduce um, Dr. Pratt. Okay, Thanks, Rick. Holly. Thanks. In 2004, the Hutton family, in collaboration with the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine, asked Dr. John Hutton what they could do to commemorate his many years of service to the College of Medicine, first as dean of the college and later as chair of the Department of Biomedical Informatics. As a lifelong proponent of medical education and an unwavering commitment to instilling strong leadership, values, and patient-centered care in the students, faculty, and staff of the College of Medicine. The college proposed creating an endowed chair of ethics in John's name. While he was no doubt honored by the request, he asked instead about the possibility of creating an endowed lectureship offered each year to bring in thought leaders from around the world, specifically to challenge our ideas and stimulate meaningful discussions about many of today's most pressing problems in medicine. The goal of this lectureship is to not only introduce our community to thought leaders from around the world, but to challenge our thinking and keep the flow of ideas fresh, thought provoking, and in the best interest of those we serve, our patients, young and old alike. Each year, the Hutton Lectureship serves as one of the keynote presentations of Research and Innovation Week. This year's Hutton Lectureship speaker is Dr. Bridget Pratt from the Australian Catholic University and honorary at the University of Melbourne. Dr. Pratt is an international leader in the field of global health research ethics and health systems research ethics. With international tension strained and dialogue hampered by cultural and historic patterns and norms, it is precisely Bridget's work in international and research ethics that allowed us, caused us actually, to reach out to her specifically. She received her PhD in international research ethics from Monash University in Australia and completed a postdoctoral fellowship at Johns Hopkins Berman Institute of Bioethics. She's currently the modern lecturer in healthcare ethics in the Queensland Bioethics Center at Australian Catholic University. Her current work focuses on equity, social and ecological justice in international research. It is now my absolute pleasure to introduce this year's Hutton Lectureship speaker, Dr. Bridget Pratt, and her talk entitled, Confronting the Global Crisis in Knowledge Production for Health. Bridget. Thanks. Okay, just gonna share my screen. So, 
So today I'm going to be talking about a crisis that's affecting health research. And it's probably not a crisis that is getting a lot of airplay. There are a lot of other crises going on at the moment. This week is, I mean, kind of perversely well-timed, honestly. Um, but the crisis that I'm gonna talk about is one that actually affects our capacity to address a lot of other crises like COVID, like climate change, like health inequity, and to mitigate their effects. And it's also a crisis that we as researchers are really well positioned to make a difference in. And I'm hoping that by the end of my talk, you'll have some more strategies for how you might do that within your own practice. So before jumping into the crisis in knowledge production for global health, a few disclaimers. Um, I have no conflicts of interest to disclose and the views that I'm about to present are my own and not the University of Cincinnati's or ACU's. Um, and I thought I'd just tell you a little bit more about who I am and where I've been. Um, as you can tell from the accent I still have after 15 years, um, I'm originally from the US. I did my undergrad at Haverford and majored in biology. And for those who know Haverford, you know that it's got a really strong social justice tradition, which somehow it just rubbed off on me. It wasn't intentional. It just, I left there and that was firmly ingrained. And I ended up going to India after I graduated and then eventually found my way down to Melbourne and worked in an HIV vaccine lab for a bit before going back to do my master's in global health. And then as Rick said, a PhD in international research ethics. And that PhD was focused on how do you design international clinical research to promote social justice and health equity. After that, I went to Johns Hopkins for two years and that fellowship was looking at how do you design health systems research in low and middle income countries to promote social justice. So it's been a recurrent theme, this focus on how do you design research to promote social justice in the work that I've done. Um, and then I came back to Australia for the second half of that fellowship. And most recently in the middle of state lockdowns and state border closures <laughs> last year, I moved up from Melbourne to Brisbane uh, up to Australian Catholic University where I'm still working on research ethics, but I'm also getting to do some more work on health systems and climate change around the ethics of sustainable healthcare. So that's me. And as I was saying before, we're currently in the midst of a lot of crises. So Ukraine and COVID are probably at the top of the list in terms of media coverage, but we're also facing other crises like climate change, like poverty and health inequity. And the picture on, I think the right of your screen, maybe it's the left, um, is actually out in front of my apartment building about a month ago. And I don't know if it made the news in the US, but we effectively got 80% of our annual rainfall in about three days here. Um, and honestly, where I was actually wasn't that bad. That picture there is of Lismore, which is a couple of hours away. That town was basically wiped off. It just got completely flooded out. And about three days ago, it actually just happened again. I mean, we got about a hundred millimeters in a day here and they just got completely flooded again. Mm. So climate change, is a massive problem. And the other thing that I wanna emphasize here is that these global crises are largely interconnected. So climate change is worsening poverty. Its effects are disproportionately felt by the global poor. And climate change is also 
causing the spreading of infectious disease. It's causing more frequent heat waves and droughts. And this is affecting people's health and well being, and particularly that of those who are more disadvantaged and marginalized. So, climate change is also worsening health inequities. And then you've got the crisis in knowledge production for global health, which the field of health research is just not generating the knowledge we need to help resolve these global crises or to mitigate their effects. And when I'm talking about knowledge production for global health, I just, I wanna clarify exactly what type of health research I'm talking about. So I'm talking about health research that is focusing on problems with a global effect, like health inequity, like poverty related illnesses and like pandemics. And then I'm also talking about health research that is performed with populations in the global South. And the global South does encompass low and middle income countries, but it also includes marginalized groups and populations within high income countries. So for example, indigenous populations within the US Australia and Canada. And as you can see, global health research focuses on generating the knowledge we need to address global crises and mitigate their effects. Except it's currently facing a crisis of its own that is really significantly impacting its ability to do that. And this crisis actually isn't new. It's one that has been going on for quite some time. Um, and it's probably only in the past couple of years that it's really come to the forefront in the literature. And so one part of that crisis is that global health research exhibits these really big asymmetries in power and privilege. If you look to see who's getting funded in global health research, it's actually really hard for recipients in the global south to get research funding. A lot of times they're not even eligible. The funder won't even accept applications where they are the primary applicant. And WHO data even shows in 2019 that out of all the biomedical research funding in the world, only 1.2% went to recipients in institutions in the global south. And I mean, the 1090 gap is something that was talked about 30 years ago. I wasn't necessarily that old at that point, and I learned about it you know, after the fact, but that was 30 years ago. And it doesn't seem like it's gotten any better, which is very concerning. And there are still articles being written that describe an unfair division of labor within global health research, where researchers from the global south are essentially glorified field workers or data collectors. They don't have a role in grant writing or coming up with the actual research agenda. And the result there is that you don't get research that's actually really responsive to on the ground needs of those who are disadvantaged and marginalized. It also means that the benefits of global health research, the knowledge benefits don't often flow back to the populations where the research is done. And the money involved is often just recycled in high income country economies. Another part of the crisis is that there are often many epistemic wrongs within the field of global health research. So cultural imperialism and Eurocentrism in particular are really inherent in the field. You see a silencing of epistemologies, of theories and of methods from the global south. And this is a problem because it means that certain global health problems and solutions to those problems aren't conceptualized at all or aren't conceptualized as fully as they might be. The transformative potential of the field to generate new interventions to address complex crises like poverty and health inequity is really, really stunted. And it's a concerning problem that has only, I think, been talked about most recently in the past few years. 
So it raises the question, you know, there's a crisis. What do we do about it? And I think that the fields of global health research needs a transformation if it is going to transform global health and health inequity. And what I'm going to propose in my talk today is that social justice is a way forward out of the crisis. If we start designing global health research to promote social justice, and I'm not saying that none is currently doing that, actually there is some that is, but if we start designing the majority of global health research to advance social justice, I think we're gonna be much better able to generate the knowledge we need to address various global crises and to mitigate their effects. And so this raises the question, which I'm going to spend the rest of the presentation talking about, which is, you know, how do we actually go about designing global health research to promote social justice? And so in the remainder of the talk, I'm going to first introduce a multi-dimensional social justice lens, which I've been developing for the past year or two. And that lens identifies five different dimensions of social justice. And by dimensions, I mean different understandings or conceptions of what social justice is and what it's aiming to achieve. And so for each dimension, I'm going to define what it is and then talk about what corresponding responsibilities it identifies for global health research. And then I'll cover a few strategies that researchers, research institutions, and educators can actually use in their practice to uphold the different responsibilities. And here I'm not saying that funders and journals don't also have responsibilities, but given the audience is, to my knowledge, mostly researchers and educators, I thought it made more sense to focus on strategies that you'd be able to actually use in your own work. So the social justice lens that I've developed, as I said, it has five different dimensions, well-being, recognition, power, inclusion, and harmony. And these different dimensions are drawn from theories of social justice from both the global north and the global south. And the motivation behind developing this lens was that I realized in my own work, I was primarily using theories of social justice that talked about well being and inclusion, and that they were mostly from the global north. And it felt like that was an epistemic wrong in itself. And I really wanted to be able to analyze things from a social justice perspective that was informed by ideas from the global South as well as the global North. So I started kind of back at square one, doing a lot of reading of philosophy that I'd never gotten to read at any point up until then, or I hadn't realized that I should have been reading. And it was over this process that I eventually came to develop a social justice lens with five different dimensions. And it's interesting, the recognition, power, and harmony dimensions are ones that are more emphasized in the theories from the global South, which if you think about their actual ontological starting points and the experiences of colonialism that informed theories, it actually makes a lot of sense. And I'm happy to speak to that in the question part. The theories from the global north often emphasize well being and inclusion. Sometimes they do discuss recognition and power, but they mostly don't discuss harmony. And these are just broad generalizations that I've come across through what I've read, which to clarify isn't the extent of everything that's out there. So these are just generalizations based on the reading that I've done. And so starting with the power dimension. 
social justice is about reducing unfair power relations that create an uneven playing field where some people have to work really hard to have a decent life and other people don't really have to work quite so hard. And so these unfair power relations create social norms, social institutions, and social rules that essentially favor some people over others. And theorists have identified a number of different types of unfair power relations. And just relevant to this talk, I'm going to focus on just three. Uh, subordination is talking about control of social groups. So a privileged few get to make decisions and get to make the rules that affect other social groups of which they are not a part. And this encompasses unfair divisions of labor where you have a few people who get to make all the decisions and then everybody else has to then go and execute decisions that they weren't part of making. Another unfair power relation is exploitation. And that's where you have people in positions of power take advantage of other less powerful people's vulnerability to extract an unearned and also an unequal benefit. And finally, there's coloniality, which refers to really long-standing unfair power relations like subordination and exploitation that have emerged as a direct result of colonialism. And when you think about what unfair power relations affect global health research, you really have to come back to coloniality. Imperialism and the imperialist origins of global health are pretty well documented. It's a field that was really birthed in colonialism and continues to display a lot of features of coloniality. And then if so, if you think about in the context of global health research, reducing unfair power relations, it really means first acknowledging the colonial history and inherent coloniality in global health research by those who fund it. So, so those who fund it, teach it, publish it, and conduct it need to acknowledge where the field has come from and what current coloniality features it has. And then the other side is that they should be actively working to reduce those unfair power relations by shifting control and benefits to those in the global South and also by avoiding unfair divisions of labor. So those are two responsibilities for the field about reducing unfair power dynamics. And then in terms of strategies, so what can researchers and research institutions and educators do to actually uphold those responsibilities? There are a number of things you can do, and I'm only coming up with a few strategies here. It's not an exhaustive list. Um, but one thing that's really useful is researchers having reflexive discussions about the power dynamics within their research team and within the field of global health research as a whole, kind of during the whole research project process. So at the start, during, and towards the end, um, it's just really important to talk about power dynamics and have potentially confronting conversations with people about them. Um, another strategy is to really think about, you know, who gets to be part of grant writing and setting the research questions and topics. You know, is it just researchers from the global north or are there actually any researchers from the global south who are getting to do that? And then if you find out, you know, there aren't any researchers from the global south, you know, making an actual effort to include them in those parts of the, the research process. And at the education end, I think if a research training program or a global health training program doesn't have significant content on the colonial origins and inherent coloniality in the field, then it's not doing its job. Uh, social justice is also about uh, making sure individuals, communities, and nature 
have adequate well-being. And by nature, I'm talking about living beings like animals and plants, non-living beings like soil and rivers, and also collectives like ecosystems. And ensuring well-being has a positive end and a negative end. So at the negative end, it's about really making sure that you don't push individuals, communities, and nature below an adequate level of well-being. And then at the positive end, it's about trying to bring those who are below an adequate level up to that level of well-being. And here, priority is often given to those who are systematically disadvantaged. So they fall below an adequate level of well-being on several different aspects of well-being. And often poverty has been used as one possible metric for systematic disadvantage. And in terms of global health research, the positive end of well-being really calls for the field to prioritize generating knowledge about the structural determinants of poor health for those who are systematically disadvantaged. So addressing the structural determinants is a really key way of alleviating systematic disadvantage. And by structural determinants, I'm talking about unfair power relations, social norms, social rules, and social institutions that create an unequal playing field where it's a lot easier for some people to maintain their health and it's a lot harder for others to do that. It's also important that global health research not push individuals, communities, and nature below an adequate level of well-being. And so in terms of strategies for researchers and research institutes to uphold these responsibilities, one is to think about the research topics that you're focusing on and to think about whether or not you can do more research on the structural determinants of health in the global south, or at least try and do more research that is actually about improving the health of those in the global south, remembering that this does encompass marginalized populations in high income countries as well. Another strategy is to think about your research project's carbon footprint and try and minimize that. Research, particularly international clinical trials, can have a massive carbon footprint. There's a lot of air travel. There's a lot of transport of medicines between countries, and it adds up. Um, and also, research institutes can also do a lot here. If they, if they actually prioritize getting a core group of researchers who can do structural determinants of health research, and then also create a culture where that type of research is valued, it can be quite important. Um, I've worked at places where the global health departments are maybe 98% um, quantitative researchers, which is an ideal. I've also worked at places where you've got a lot of people doing social determinants of health research, but they're not valued. They're basically told that public health is about epidemiology and what they do, you know, isn't a core part of it. So neither is ideal. Recognition focused concepts of social justice are really focused on the recognition of difference and diversity. So they often have two components. Uh, one is around demonstrating respect for difference and diversity. And the other is around making difference and diversity visible. On the flip side, uh, recognition-focused concepts call for avoiding misrecognition. So that means avoiding disrespecting different social groups and devaluing them. And it also means not making their cultures, their ways of knowing, their ideas and their perspectives invisible. And when you think about global health research and what forms of misrecognition affect the field, I mean, both 
devaluing and silencing affect the field. As I said earlier, cultural imperialism is inherent. Um, the theories, epistemologies, and methods from the global South are not valued and they're not visible in the field. You don't see that many global health research projects using those types of theories and epistemologies and methods. Uh, funding selection criteria and often devalue them relative to kind of the more rigorous scientific quantitative um, methods and also in terms of education programs and even education programs in the global south they often mainly teach the theories and epistemologies from the global north so the field of global health research really has a responsibility to become better informed and to use the epistemologies theories and concepts and methods from the global south a lot more than it does and in terms of strategies for how you might be able to uphold that responsibility. I mean, I can understand it might seem a bit daunting because if you yourself are not trained in those sorts of methods, it's not easy to jump into a completely new area of expertise, but that's when collaboration is a really useful tool. And you can look up, look for people that you can collaborate with from the global South who maybe use some really interesting methods and come from a really interesting background. You can also potentially hire PhD students who might want to ex explore those avenues. Another strategy that's important is dialogue. And that kind of dialogue about, you know, what sorts of methods and theories should underlie the whole field of global health is one that I think is really important for a research institution to facilitate amongst its researchers. And then I also think at the project level, every time you're designing a new research project, having that conversation with the research team, you know, what are all the different types of methods and theories and epistemologies that we could use to tackle this research question? And something else that's important here is research institution hiring. So it's, it's potentially a lot more valuable to have these conversations with people who are actually trained in epistemologies and theories and methods from the global South. But if you don't have any on staff, it becomes a lot trickier. So, it's important for research institutions to really make sure that they're getting a diverse pool of researchers when they're hiring. Social justice, in terms of its fourth dimension, it calls for the meaningful inclusion of individuals and communities in decision-making. That means that those affected have a right to be represented uh, in both diversity and in numbers. They have a right to say what they would like to say, so to have their voice raised. And then they also have a right to have their voice heard. And deeper or more meaningful participation is often associated with entry at the start of a decision-making process. It's associated with having an equal opportunity to raise your voice. And it's also associated with being a decision maker rather than a consultant. Consultants get to provide input that then decision makers may or may not use. So they're not actually part of decision making in the sense that they have any power over what output comes out. So to be deeply inclusive, the field of global health research should try and achieve diversity and shared decision-making within collaborations, within funding bodies, and within journals. It should also try and meaningfully engage the communities with whom the research is being done. And in terms of strategies here, I think for researchers, one thing to think about is the diversity of your own research team on different projects and also the leadership or steering group, if it's kind of a big consortium as well. And thinking about, you know, what's the geographic diversity? What's the diversity in terms of gender, race and ethnicity, physical ability, language? There are just lots of, lots of ways that you can assess that. And you can often realize that there are some gaps in terms of the diversity of the research team. 
I think it's also important to take an approach to decision making that is deliberative and where you really try and make decisions as a team from grant writing forwards. And this includes community partners and with community members. And I think that research institutions have an important role to play in terms of community engagement. I think it can be really helpful when they have community engagement units with community engagement practitioners employed because those individuals can assist researchers to carry out community engagement in their work, um, which is something that I don't think a lot of us are always trained to do. Um, even though community engagement has become really important back when people who are doing research now were educated, it was not necessarily part of the education program, although hopefully that is changing. And finally, social justice is about social harmony and building relationships of shared identity and solidarity. So shared identity and solidarity have both attitudinal and practice-oriented components. So sharing identity is really about building attitudes of cohesion and we-ness, so sort of feeling that you are part of a whole, like you're all part of the same community and the same team. And that really supports cooperative behaviors where people work together to try and achieve shared goals. The kind of attitudinal bases of solidarity are a little bit different. Um, solidarity is about um, recognizing that you're interconnected, um, being able to kind of think what is it like to be in this other person's shoes and also having you know, mutual respect and trust, which means that you will then adopt behaviors where you'll come to the aid of the people who, with whom you feel solidarity or you'll also work for the common good because essentially if part of the ship sinks, the whole ship sinks. So these are aspects of shared identity and solidarity. And in terms of global health research, it's important to build these senses of cohesion and solidarity at the collaboration and institutional levels. So that means building cohesion and solidarity within research teams and also between research teams and the communities with whom they're working. At the institutional level, it's about building a sense of cohesion and solidarity, you know, within the global health research institution, and then also between global health research institutions to kind of build feelings of cohesion and solidarity within the, the whole field of global health. Um, and so the strategies around this are really about relationship building strategies. Um, and informal interactions are, it, they're, it sounds quite simple and it, it can be, they're really important just in terms of building cohesion and solidarity within research teams and with community members. And often people have described to me that if you do things where both the researchers and the community members don't know what they're doing, this is a really good thing to do because it equalizes the playing field nobody has any knowledge. So it can just be an activity that nobody's good at. I mean, or nobody would probably be good at that doesn't have anything to do with research, um, just to kind of break the ice. Uh, embeddedness experiences and exchange programs are also really useful. So different research institutions having exchanges between researchers. So somebody from an institution in the global north going to the global south and vice versa. Um, so those are just a couple of strategies there. And I'm going to finish with just a couple of take home messages here. The first is that I've proposed here that social justice is a way forward out of the crisis in knowledge production for global health. And second, that I think that researchers and educators and research institutions really have a big role to play here. It's within our power to change our practice and to make a big impact on this crisis. And hopefully some of the strategies that I've described today 
are ones that you can actually take back into your practice. At the same time, even though I think a transformation of global health research is needed, transformations are not always zero to 100. So I think the aim is really for people to be trying to make significant improvements from one project to the next. So you're getting better at designing your research to promote social justice. And I think that's the main benchmark to be aiming for, not to magically transform from one project to the next. It's a learning process. Um, so I'm going to finish there. Thank you all for listening. And I'll turn over to Holly and Rick to um, take over with questions. Great, thank you so much, Bridget. That was that was wonderful. Um, I will go ahead and um, and this is we usually don't have such a small group, so this is wonderful. Um, and so Rick and I invite you all to, um, obviously you can use the chat to send your questions to us, or you could also um, unmute yourselves and um, we can have a dialogue with Bridget, um, which is what we usually do when we're in person. And so I welcome you to, to ask your questions. Um, while you guys are formulating, um, uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and take advantage <laughs> of this opportunity to ask the first question. Um, Rick is smiling because he knows I do this. Um, but I guess, so Bridget, this was fantastic um, and certainly something that we should all be aspiring. And, and Bridget, let me ask you to stop sharing your screen so we can see your face more. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so, um, so as I was mentioning, just something, you know, you've presented this framework that is comprehensive and um, idealistic um, to some degree, but um, I guess, you know, one of the first questions that come to mind is, is there a group that is doing this type of research that is partnering with the Global South that has inclusiveness, that has um, you know, the, the power dynamics um, thought out that's designing the research from the very beginning um, with the folks who, um, not just like consultants, like you said, but a, um, an inclusive nature. Um, so is there is there somebody out there that we can learn from, um, whether it's a clinical trial or other type of research um, that we can look at, look toward? Um, I think there are a lot of collaborations out there that are really trying to do things well. And as I said, it's a, it's a learning process. It depends, I think, I know a number of groups who it's kind of early in their collaborative partnership. Mm -hmm. And so they're doing a lot of things right, but there's still areas where they can improve, but they come at it with a, a critical and constructive lens. So they, they know that they want to improve and they kind of interrogate their practice with each project so they can identify where they want to keep improving. And I think that kind of attitude is the, one of the most important things. It's just being open to the fact that it's not perfect, but you need to know what's not perfect in order to get closer to something that's better than what you're already doing. So I think that's kind of the attitude to take. Um, and yeah, I don't, I, I don't wanna create the impression that all global health research collaborations are doing a bad job. There are, there are some that are really working very hard. And I think that there's a big push at the moment to decolonize the field. And I think that's making a lot of people interrogate how they conduct their research um, a lot more than maybe they, had before. Um, so I think that that's important as well. Thank you. So yeah, I, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't give you a, a group that's doing it 100%. I just, I can think of groups that are, are working really hard and approaching it with the right attitudes. Um, well, and I know I could, I could monopolize the rest of your time just we could dive into the FDA issues and, and all these <laughs> things that have driven um, industry research that's 
taken away yeah. from some of those opportunities and, and, um, but I will open it up to, um, others yeah. on the call who might and, have questions. And that's what I would say. I mean, one of the reasons groups can find it hard, even when they have attitudes is because, you know, the funding environment also needs to change. Like there are structures within the research system, which is why the theoretical framework includes them because, you know, funders aren't designing their funding schemes in a way that would make people create projects that promote social justice, then, you know, it's harder. Um, if funders don't fund community engagement before kind of the research agenda is already set, mm -hmm. it's a lot harder to involve communities in setting your research agenda. So Go Bridget, ahead, the, um, so when you talk about unfamiliar epistemologies and access to new and unfamiliar ones, philosophy has gone through this. Science has gone through this, and particularly in the last three or four decades, and particularly the history and philosophy of science, people only having access to Western discoveries and Western knowledge bases and those kind of things. So is there an analogy here? And for the earnest health researcher, how beyond shared experience with the team that they may not have, how can they get access to the literature knowing that the structures have been in place for years, but how can they get access to these epistemologies and these unfamiliar approaches and strategies? Yeah, I mean, again, I, I do think collaboration or at least forming relationships with researchers who do use them and would have greater expertise is important. I mean, networks are also important. If you know somebody who knows somebody who can kind of connect you with somebody, that's useful. Um, I think maybe once we're doing conferences in person again, uh, being strategic in terms of, I'm gonna go to meet this person, that, that can be useful. Um, and then I think, I mean, I think you can also do your own reading as well. Like, I know you, people may not necessarily have been trained in certain methods or theories, but I mean, you can start learning about them on your own, not necessarily with the intention of I'm going to be an expert and I can do this on my own, but you can at least start getting an idea of what these theories and methods involve. And then that could also give you a better sense as to who to get in touch with in terms of collaborating. Okay, thanks. So one follow-up, and then I promise I won't keep asking questions. So you, you've, you've, in your taxonomy or your schemata, you have a lot of positive pro-social kind of um, dimensions, which is, which is great. Have you encountered um, assumptions that different people make, different cultures make, different um, research groups make that either stands in the way of the collaborations or, cert, or works against them, either in their discoveries, their, their push for care and treatment, other things. Can you talk at all about the assumptions, the kind of preconditions that people bring to, to these relationships? Yeah, I mean, that's true. This, this framework is based on social justice, which, mm -hmm is not a value that everyone is necessarily going to share. Um, I think I would, I would hope that because certain parts of the concepts come from different parts of the world, there would be at least aspects of the framework that would resonate. Maybe not all of them, but there'd be at least some common ground to start on. Um, and I think possibly starting with aspects of the framework that come from the kind of non-Western side, if you're working overseas, might be a useful entry point. Um, but yeah, there are situations where the values, and I think being upfront about the values is important too, because when you have conversations with people and you can upfront 
kind of decide our values do not align, then that's probably not going to be a fruitful collaboration. And ideally, you'd want to work with a partner somewhere that shared your values. I think that's an important foundation to have. Um, so that potentially that might not be the right community for you specifically to work in. Um, or there might be others who you can think of who would be a better option. But yeah, the value conflict one is a, it's a tricky one. I think I like trying to find mutual common ground rather than assuming we have nothing in common um, as a starting point. I think once you really feel like there's not much to work from here, that's when you kind of have to make a decision that it might not be the right partnership. All right, thank you. Dr. Kate. Thank you, Dr. Pratt. <clears throat> My question is, is your claim an epistemological claim that being more inclusive, let's just say all that taxonomy, let's just say inclusive for just right now, that being more inclusive brings about better knowledge or is it primarily a claim that it's more just to do that? I think it's both. Mm -hmm. I, think, um, I think it's more just to include everybody, but I also think that there are arguments that bring different types of knowledge together. You can potentially come up with something that is going to be better than what you would have come up with otherwise. I think there's definitely literature out there that talks about how we've done a lot of work based on theories and epistemologies from the global north, and we haven't solved a lot of things yet, and that there is really inherent value in the knowledge that can be drawn from people who have spent most of their lives struggling and trying to overcome injustice. So they seem like the people who would have them a lot of knowledge about how to survive and how to do things in a way that would actually be quite important. So yeah, there's, there's definitely some literature out there that really captures why the knowledge of people in the global South is actually vitally important to overcoming complex crises. Um, and I think, I mean, it's, I mean, for example, with climate change, I mean, indigenous populations have lived in harmony with the environment for centuries. I, and the fact that we don't necessarily use a lot of their knowledge, probably because it would suggest completely fundamentally rearranging our whole like economic paradigm. But, you know, there's, there's incredible value in what they know. Thanks, Bridget. Um, Andy? Hi, thank, uh, thank you for this. Um, so I'm, I'm really interested when uh, different kinds of novel collective action problems, uh, you know, arise, and this strikes me as a very interesting sort of collective action problem. Um, and so I, I know you know what a collective action problem is, but I'm just for the audience, I'll just say quickly. So a collective action problem, that's when uh, it's in everybody's interests to behave a certain way but it's in each individual's own interests or each organization's own interests in this case to, to behave a little differently um, and, not, and not go along. So like recycling's like this, voting's like this. And you know, there's sort of two camps for how you resolve a collective action problem. There's, it's gonna involve an enormous amount of regulation. Like we would need some kind of governing bodies to sort of impose legislation to require uh, research teams to go in a certain direction. Now that could be governmental or it could be just a few people with the power and the money to have lots of carrots and sticks. So that's one. The other is massive cultural change, which requires a lot of trust, education, uh, probably finding some interest convergence so people can see what's in it for them. And if they don't see what's in it for them, a kind of culture of you're a bit of a pariah if you don't fall in line kind of thing, There's you got to change the culture in some way. So I guess my question is, do you see one of those avenues as more promising? And do you have other ideas as to how that might go about? Or is there a third option that I'm missing? Um, I like to cover my bases. I think, 
I think the funders need to restructure what they're doing to create incentives to do better research. But then I also think the education system is vitally important. And if you're mass producing a bunch of researchers who have you know, no understanding of the colonial history of global health, who don't have any knowledge of theories beyond Western theory, I mean, you're not gonna be creating a new generation of researchers who'll do anything any differently. So I think both are quite important. I also think that just there, there are gonna be people out there who are really trying to do things well and getting them into to kind of leadership and positions of power somehow. I don't, they're just certain people who are really trying to do global health research in the best way that they know how and are open to taking constructive, you know, suggestions about how they could potentially improve. And I think it's really important when they get up to senior positions because then junior researchers will model their behavior based on them. So I think that's also really key. I do think that, you know, there are gonna be people who don't want to do research this way. And one question that I haven't totally explored is, you know, I, I don't know how much research, not all research necessarily needs to be designed this way. I think there's still scope to do research that doesn't quite fall into ticking all of these boxes. Like there will be some research that's of value that doesn't tick these boxes. Um, but I think that might be more about the research topics. I still think that, you know, trying to, address power disparities within the research team, there'll still be parts of this framework that I think should apply to most research or all research. Thank you. Well, that um, concludes our time. I know everyone is um, um, getting ready for, for dinner and everything else. And, and uh, Dr. Pratt managed to somehow go on a really early morning run <laughs> before. Uh, um, no, I... I didn't, I was up at the correct time because I was going to, but then I realized daylight savings and it was daylight an hour savings. earlier. Yes, we almost missed Dr. Pratt today. <laughs> so thanks everybody for being with us this evening. And um, I'll be following up with sending an evaluation for it. And I'd appreciate if you would return those to me. Um, thanks everyone, especially thank you to Dr. Pratt for being with us today and, and sharing this framework with us and um, something that we can aspire to work toward. So thanks everybody. Everybody enjoy the rest of your night. Thank you so much.